The following is a text exchange which occurred between brothers on June 13th, 2021. 9.50 a.m. A humpback whale off Cape Cod tried to swallow a lobsterman right after he jumped in the water. The dude had no idea what had happened until he felt around in the mouth of the whale and realized there were no teeth, so it couldn't be a shark. And then the whale surfaced and just spat the guy out with a dislocated knee. Sounds like a movie-themed ride at Universal Studios. I have never been to one of those studios, so I will take your word for it. If only Jonah could have been so lucky, his ordeal would have been less noteworthy, but no less exciting. These days, it's pretty much all simulator rides to make you feel like you're battling a beast or something. So all the whale swallowing incident is lacking is a movie based on the incident, and then the ride will follow shortly after. Straight from the heartland, this is Things I Text My Brother. Hey folks, and welcome back to another episode of Things I Text My Brother, a series of conversations which have taken place between the Brothers Drew Yard on subjects spanning the neighborhood and the globe, which will hopefully leave you smarter, kinder, and better looking. Today we're going to jump off from that dramatic reading that you just heard and discuss the topics therein. Maybe we'll talk about the Titanic. Maybe we'll talk about the Star of the East. Maybe we'll talk about Quaker captains, Nineveh, a man called Peleg, or a miniature golf course on Calvary. But we haven't plotted our exact course yet because we want you to join us on that journey. That's how it works on Things I Text My Brother. I'm Jeff. This is Brad. Let's talk about our texts. But before we plunge into the possibly dangerous, whale-infested waters of the text that we mentioned a moment ago, we need to take a look back because it's always important to make time to cleanse ourselves of our past sins and to continue our boundless quest for self-improvement through worthless information. Thus, it's time for ablutions and edification. Unfortunately, as is often the case these days, I need to start things off with my own ablution, which I'm very embarrassed about. Pull it together, Dreer. I know, right? In our last episode, Hallmark Christmas Movies and the Soviet Santa, I referred to one of the Christmas movies taking place in Dolly Land. It was Winnie Cooper, a.k.a. Danica McKellar, ended up there once she left the big city. But it's not Dolly Land. Everybody knows that it's Dollywood. And these days, millions of visitors come there per year and take part in all the things that you could have seen on the Hallmark Christmas movie. I think it was called Christmas in Dollywood, featuring Danica McKellar, a.k.a. Winnie Cooper. That is my ablution. Edify us, brother. I'm going to stick with the same episode. Ooh. We talked a little bit about how the whole idea of Hallmark Christmas movies and the whole Christmas season is somewhat nightmarish for me. Mm. And we discussed the fact that there is a Christmas con where you can go and celebrate your Hallmark movie favorites. Yep. Edison, New Jersey, as I recall. There is also a set of three Wyndham hotels that have Hallmark Channel Countdown to Christmas Holiday Suites. What? They have the classic Hallmark Channel Suite in Manhattan, Country Christmas in Nashville, hmm. and in Avon near Vail, they have Snowy Mountain Christmas. That all sounds delightful. Have you been to all of them? I haven't been to any of them. They're $295 per night with a minimum of two or three nights stay. You do get a room replete with cookie decorating station, nice. gingerbread house making, a Christmas card station that includes stamps and an in-room mailbox for sending your Christmas cards, a hot cocoa station, and more. Anything else? No, that's it for my edification. If you have basically six to nine hundred dollars you want to throw away on Christmas for your family, there's another way you can do it. Well, bah humbug indeed. Indeed. Well, with our ablutions and edification out of the way, it's probably time to jump into a real-life nightmare after we exit the nightmare that Christmas poses you. What do you want to talk about with the nightmarish scenario, the biblical scenario of a whale potentially swallowing or at least chomping down on a human? Much like Christmas, I'm going to be the killjoy here. I think that we need to start with the scientific facts that of the 90 known species of whale, there is only one whose throat is actually wide enough to swallow a human. What? Most whales have throats that are the size of a human fist, so they couldn't swallow a human, even if they wanted to. Whoa, 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 whoa. Throats the size of a human fist? 
Yes. Even somebody with a large fist. That's not particularly large, Brad. Do you know which of the species of whale it is that could potentially swallow a human? Well, it would have to be one of the toothed whales, I assume. So that narrows it down to, what, like 75 species? Because there are 15 whale species or something like that that don't have teeth. So I can rule out humpback. I can rule Mm -hmm. out a blue whale, a gray whale. I'm going to say sperm whale. Ding, 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 ding. This is something I definitely would not have known yesterday. (laughs) Yes, the sperm whale is the only whale that has a throat large enough to swallow a human. They have found giant squid in the bellies of sperm whales, so they know that they could swallow them. But it would also be impossible for a human to survive in the belly of a whale because there's no oxygen. Yes. What happened to this gentleman was probably that he was engulfed by the whale, taken into the mouth, but not fully swallowed. Yes. So once the whale realized it made a mistake, it spit him right back out. Yeah, so some of the original articles said man swallowed by whale. Some of them said that the whale almost swallowed him, which would be a much more accurate assessment. This is all talking about a commercial lobster diver named Michael Packard. And this happened back in June of 2021, a little bit before 8 a.m. on a Friday, when Michael Packard, this experienced diver, goes into the balmy 60 degree water off of Provincetown and Cape Cod. He gets down toward the bottom and, quote, taken from the Cape Cod Times, All of a sudden, I feel this huge shove, and the next thing I know, it was completely black. He knew it wasn't a shark because there were no teeth. No teeth. That's right. What he had encountered was a humpback whale. So he's in there, he's feeling around, and quoting him, there's no way I'm getting out of here. I'm done. I'm dead. He's he's thinking of his little boys. But then the whale starts shaking his head to side after what he estimates to be 30 to 40 seconds, spits him out. He's got all kinds of bruises. He's all dinged up. One source said he had a dislocated knee. A lot of sources didn't say that. But humpback whales not usually aggressive toward humans. The whole thing with baleen whales, they're called filter feeders. So basically they take their prey into their mouth, usually small stuff that could fit down a fist sized throat. They take this all in, they squeeze the water out, trap the stuff inside, not their teeth, but this baleen, this baleen plate is basically made out of keratin, the same material that makes up our hair or fingernails. A sheet of this stuff hangs down, traps the stuff inside, then they swallow it down, and that's how they feed. So it could have never swallowed him. He didn't claim that it swallowed him. He just claimed that he got in the mouth, felt around, thought, "Uh uh-oh, this is bad, and then gets spit out. But he says, you know, once I'm back to good health, I'm going to go back out fishing again. A few sources question whether this really happened or not, but it seemed like most people took it as something that probably did happen. We do know that it can happen. Uh, We have video evidence from two kayakers near Pismo, California. What did they see? They were on their kayaks paddling around. And all of a sudden, a bait ball, which is a large group of fish that are being chased by something, come up to the surface. And they thought, oh, this can't be good. And the next thing they know, they're being lifted up into the air and tossed around in the mouth of a humpback whale, along with the bait ball. But they were immediately spit back out by the humpback whale because that is not what the humpback whale was looking for. Bait ball sounds like a nickname that somebody would have used in high school before they threw some scrawny kid up against a locker. Maybe they wouldn't call him a bait ball, but that's essentially how he was being treated. I would have been, said scrawny kid. Could you be thrown at your height? I wasn't this tall until I was like, you know, sophomore or junior. So up until then, sure. Oh, I saw some other whale and human encounters that I thought were interesting. One of the earliest ones I ran into was of a Quaker captain named Edmund Gardner in 1816. He was out in a ship and he got in the teeth of a whale and four of the whale's teeth were driven into him. One went into his skull, another broke his collarbone, another broke his arm, and one crushed his hand. And for the rest of his life, he had a crippled stump for a hand. He said that the rest of his body was squeezed into a jelly. He also said that the tooth that went into his head left a dent in his skull that looked like a broken eggshell. Interesting. Did the Quaker captain fight back? So they're supposed to be pacifists. Yeah. <laughs> he didn't remember anything. So if he fought back, he could say that he didn't, or at least didn't remember it because he uh, didn't come to till afterwards. Yeah. So that's a Quaker captain in 1816. There was also a guy around the same time that General Sherman was marching toward Atlanta, 1864. There was a guy named Peleg Nye, who apparently wasn't fighting because... I'm sorry, you you can't just say Peleg and not say how that's spelled. This man's name was Peleg, P-E-L-E-G. Oh, okay. 
I did go to listen to an author named Nils Brockman, who gave a talk that you can find called Chasing a Whale Tale, which is available on YouTube. He gave this talk at a library, and he wrote a book about Peleg Nye, the Jonah of Cape Cod. He's out there. He's the first mate of a whaling schooner called the George W. Lewis. He had previously actually been a captain, but his previous whaling schooner ran into another boat. Some people died, so he got demoted. And eventually he works his way back up to first mate. Later on, he actually becomes a captain. But according to the captain on this journey, Hiram Holmes, he was keeping a journal on this voyage. And Peleg Nye, he fell overboard as the whale that they were harpooning thrashed. He fell right into the whale's mouth. The jaws clamped down. His feet were hanging out between the teeth, just kind of flailing about, and Peleg Nye passes out. He's bruised. He's got fractured bones. When he's pulled out, his body is full of water. He had breathed in water, and he says he wished they wouldn't have brought him back to life, but they did, which took him a while. But by the time he got home, he was pretty healthy. He became a local legend and eventually did get back to being a captain again. So well done, Peleg. Well, you mentioned that Peleg was the Jonah of someplace. The Jonah of Cape Cod. So all this seems to happen on Cape Cod. Yeah. I guess you stay away from Cape Cod if you don't want to be eaten by whales. Yeah. But uh, you haven't mentioned Geppetto yet. Geppetto as in Pinocchio's, what is he? Father? Creator? Yeah, Pinocchio's father, creator, father. Geppetto gets swallowed by a whale. Does he? Yes. I had no idea. Pinocchio goes to save him, finds the whale, incredible feat in and of itself, finds the whale that swallowed Geppetto, Mm -hmm. goes into the whale with Geppetto, And they build a fire inside the whale's belly to create a sneeze in the whale, which then spits them out. I did not recall any of that. It's been a long time since I encountered a Pinocchio story. Yeah. Well, anytime you're talking about a whale swallowing a human or doing anything in which the human ends up in his mouth, Jonah certainly comes up. And along with inspiring the name of a band that I enjoyed before they broke up, which is Noah and the Whale. The story of Jonah and the whale is one of those George Washington, I shall not tell a lie type stories there to teach you good things. The story of Jonah and the whale appears not just in the Christian Old Testament, but also in similar forms in the Quran and in the Hebrew Bible. Basically, Jonah didn't want to go and preach to the enemy. The people in Nineveh who were considered the sworn enemy of the Israelites So when he was called upon by God to go preach to these people, he's like, no, dude, I'm going the other way. So he gets in a boat, he heads the opposite direction, and a storm hits, and then he's tossed from the boat. Either a big fish or a whale swallows him, and Jonah starts praying inside the whale where he stays for three days before being spit out on the shores of Nineveh. And then he does preach to his sworn enemy they do decide to correct their ways, these 120,000 Ninevites. And you would think, hey, everything's good now. Except Jono, after the fact, kind of got annoyed. He's like, dude, you're, you're just cool with this. You're going to let these people go. This isn't cool. I don't like this. And whereas initially God had put a little vine growing over Jonah as he sat outside the city pouting, he sent a worm out to eat that vine so that Jonah didn't have any shade from the sunlight. And at that point, he's like, Jonah, pull it together, buddy. There's one of you and you're worried about having shade when what you should be worried about is the 120,000 Ninevites that have just turned their things around and become good people. And the moral of the story, Brad, is... If you get swallowed by a whale, you should pray a lot. I think it's also something about we can serve best by transcending our self-interest to work for the greater good. I guess in this case, 120,000 Ninevites. But it didn't really work out for the Ninevites, considering it went into disrepair and became unpopulated compared to Mosul, which was nearby. Hmm. Well, since we were talking a little bit about the story of Jonah, which appears in the Old Testament, that got me wondering about other times where animals in the Bible might have eaten humans. And if our podcast is anything, it's a testament. It's it's a New Testament oh, to the beauty. No, 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 no. It's a, no, it's a New no. Testament to the beauty and the power of Googling random stuff and producing questionable results in terms of validity. <laughs> but now that that sounds right. One thing that this did generate for me is somebody's list. It was bible.knowing-jesus.com, you know, one of the foremost experts on animals eating people in the Bible. They, in fact, listed 41 Bible verses. Who are the other three experts if they're one of the foremost? That's a good question. The other ones would be 
Well, probably Jesus. All right. He knows and sees all. Uh, Santa also yeah. knows and sees all. Uh, well, MC Hammer, he uh, he preaches. <laughs> So yeah, according to bible.knowing-jesus.com, not directly from Jesus, Santa Claus, or MC Hammer, the 41 Bible verses about animals eating people, I looked through them to see what those were. To be perfectly honest, I got bored about 14 (laughs) into the list because... I had made it a dozen, maybe a baker's dozen into this list. And I had noticed that so far, the only thing eating people were generic beasts or wild beasts. A lot of birds preying on people. Those things are all happening in Genesis, Deuteronomy, Ezekiel, Samuel. It's it's just a whole bunch of beasts and birds eating people. Things get a little more varied once you get into 1 Kings when dogs start eating the people while they're in the city, but the birds still eat the people when they're outside the city. Is that why people were so quick to excommunicate turtle doves? Because we as humans have a history-long hatred of birds eating us? I mean, I guess, at least in the common era. Well, the Old Testament is even before. So, uh, yes. Yeah, yeah. It is worth giving the story of Jonah some credit, though, because whereas our whole story began in Provincetown in the year 2021, when Michael Packard was taken into the whale's mouth, at least the whale in the story of Jonah, at least that whale actually swallowed the person like so many of these articles on other people claim to have done. I think we've settled that whales can't actually, well, a sperm whale might be able to swallow a person, but generally they do not eat people. And we knew from a previous episode that sharks kill very few people every year. In the United States during the 2000s, it was about one person a year on average. But in the 2000s in the US, 20 unsuspecting humans on average every year were killed by nature's ninjas, the butcherous bovines. Oh, with methane? Usually crushing (laughs) because they're just big. One thing you were just mentioning sharks, and I had a thought. Don't you think that sharks, if they're going to attack people, should now, since we've set up a week just for them, that shark attacks should all happen during Shark Week? I think it's only fair if we're going to celebrate them during that week. That would be the right time to get the extra press. Yep. Going back, talking about another person who was actually swallowed. There is a famous story about a guy named James Bartley who was taking part in a whaling expedition off of the Falkland Islands back in what would be the late 19th century. He was attacked. He was swallowed. He was caught in the whale's stomach, but he was able to breathe, he said. It was just kind of hot. Apparently passes out, ends up in the whale's stomach for different accounts, say a different length of time, 36 hours, a couple days. His skin isn't doing well in there. It's getting bleached by the gas juices. Some people say he was blinded by this, although some people say he basically popped out, they dumped some water on him, and he got back to work. Uh, Apparently, in another article I read, mentioned that this story, along with others, were being used essentially as a proof of the uh, validity of Jonah's story in the Bible. And there was a college professor at Messiah College in Pennsylvania in the early 1990s. His name is Edward B. Davis. If anybody wants to know a whole lot more about this, you can look up his article, A Whale of a Tale, Fundamentalist Fish Stories. And he did extensive research into a lot of things, but particularly this very famous story of James Bartley that many people had told, but it didn't seem like it had a lot of evidence to support it. In fact, he found no evidence supporting it. He did find out that the ship on which James Bartley had been allegedly traveling, the Star of the East, That ship had existed, but there was no record of a guy named James Bartley having been on it. And the wife of that ship's captain was asked, and she stated very confidently that no man was thrown overboard on that voyage. Therefore, none of this could be true. So one of the most famous whale stories, that of James Bartley, is not true if we are to believe the scholar who invested the most time in it, Edward B. Davis. And he wanted it to be true, and he thought he had found some evidence, right? Initially, yeah, he did see some stuff that started to lead him the right direction. He had some hope, but what he later found really didn't confirm things. But that was supposedly a sperm whale, so at least they had that right. It could have potentially swallowed him. Yep. Yeah, so I was looking up other stories of survival at sea. Ooh. And one of them is a a Captain Oguri Jukichi from Japan. He and another sailor survived for 484 days floating at sea. It's the longest known survival. And they survived eating soybeans from their cargo as they floated Mm. around and were eventually found off the coast of North America. 
All the other people died of vitamin deficiency or scurvy, probably. How many days at sea? 484 days floating aimlessly. Which would be worse for your skin? 484 days of floating, presumably not very sheltered, out at sea. They were on a cargo ship, so they had shelter. Oh, because I was going to say, otherwise, I wasn't sure if 484 days exposed to the sun at sea would be worse for your skin than three days inside of a sperm whale's stomach. Because we talked about stomach acids being able to eat through razor blades and things, Ah, right? Yeah, razor blades. I have to assume it's going to be the gastric juices would be much worse. Good call. If anybody tuned into the podcast today for that answer, you just got it. I mean, we don't have anything to prove it, but I think you can lock that one up. Generally speaking, I would encourage our listeners not to take our word as gospel, but I think this one is solid. Even though you did say we were doing the New Testament here recently. So don't take it as gospel anyway. We have created the New Testament. I don't remember what it was about. So now you're just confusing everybody. Yeah. My favorite story of survival, though, is there's a guy named Arthur John Priest. What was his name? Arthur John Priest. So Wait, Father Arthur? He wasn't a priest, but his name was Arthur John Priest. Very confusing. I know we're just confusing everyone now. Mm. So Arthur John Priest survived the sinking of the Titanic in 1912. Obviously, lots of people survived. But prior to that, he survived a collision between the Olympic and the HMS Hawk in 1911, which was a tragic event. Then after the Titanic, he survived the sinking of the Alcantara in February 1916 Hmm. and the Britannic in November of 1916 and the Donegal in April 1917. Hmm. Now, all of those were during World War I, so they were related to attacks and things. Yeah. But uh, basically, he said he quit sailing because no one wanted him on their ship after that. Nice. (laughs) Which seems reasonable. You know who else survived the sinking of the Titanic? Leonardo DiCaprio. No, he died. That's right, he died. There was plenty of room on that piece of wood for him, though. Well, that theory has been thrown around many times, but what people leave out is that Kate Winslet should have been charged with manslaughter for not bringing him on. Just pull him up. But you you know who else survived? All right, who survived? It's your friend Billy Zane. You should listen to your friend Billy Zane. He's a cool guy. Billy Zane's a cool guy, huh? I learned that from Hansel. Yeah, there were lots of people who survived the Titanic and also were on the Olympic when it crashed into the HMS Hawk. Rich people floating around. And that were on the Britannic. Hmm. I once heard a story, and I'll have to look and see if this one is true. So no ablutions for getting this one wrong. But (laughs) I heard a story one time about a woman who lived in New York, but she was watching the Thanksgiving Day Parade. A balloon hit a streetlight. It fell down on her head. She got some kind of injury, sued Macy's or the city of New York or somebody, won a settlement, bought a much bigger, fancier apartment, which was later damaged when a student pilot who happened to be an obscure New York Yankees player flew his airplane into her apartment by accident, which she wasn't there, but she was having an equally bad run of luck there. I don't know who she is or if this is true, but if I do see her, I'm not going to hang out with her. And I believe that is true. We went to the Macy's parade one year, my family and I, and I was doing some reading about the mishaps that happened. And I did read a story about that. I don't remember the woman's name, but yeah, Mm. that sounds right. Well, spoiler guys, this might not be an illusion, but you could potentially hear more about this in a future episode. Just send us a message. What do you know about this lady or anything else? You can leave us a message at things I text my brother podcast on Instagram where every episode has its own link for you to give comments on things just like that. There is one other topic that I wanted to talk about, which was mentioned in the original text, and that was the whole thing about a whale-eating person being possibly the inspiration for a ride at a place like Universal Studios, because they have rides there, that there's minions, you're flying around Hogwarts, Transformers, Spider-Man... All these things, they're not really taking you on a roller coaster thing. They're taking you through a simulator. And I was thinking it would be cool if there was a theme park that had a simulator ride, which could show the experience of being chomped down on by a whale. I was thinking it could even be Jonah themed. And then the perfect place jumped to my mind. It's the Holy Land Experience theme park, which I have often gone past on the highway in the middle of Orlando, Florida. I wanted to check to see if they had just such a ride. As it turns out, the Holy Land experience is no more. It closed in 2021. I don't think it did have this Jonah experience, though. It had reenactments of the resurrection and had a miniature first century Jerusalem, but I didn't see anything about a simulator ride. Probably not because it was hemorrhaging money for the 20 years that it existed. 
But as I looked into this, I just happened to run into an article on the website Christianity Today, which mentioned some other biblical themed attractions which had closed. And according to an author by the name of James, I'm not sure how it's pronounced, Bilo, B-I-E-L-O, he wrote a book which was released also in 2021 called Materializing the Bible. The whole premise of it was talking about spaces which were used to recreate part of the Bible. So you could have a more experiential grasp of the Bible. And he mentioned that most of them were inspired by somebody who had some money and a lot of enthusiasm. They opened something. It has this big burst of popularity at first, and then it dies off. That was the Holy Land experience as well. At the end, it was losing about $5 million a year. But I really like the fact that this author, he mentioned some other places that were closed. A drive-through Bible garden? Sure, why not? Mm -hmm. Brad, could I interest you in a theme park based on the book of Job? It's the suffering of Job, right? Yeah. I, why would I want to go a place to suffer? I mean, I, I would just go to the Hallmark movie Christmas Con. <laughs> So maybe that's why that one didn't work. The Holy Land experience probably makes a little bit more sense. A little bit, yeah. I also found out that another place, which is unfortunately no more, which I would have loved to have experienced, was a mini golf park in Kentucky named the Golgotha Fun Park. Brad, do you know another name for Golgotha? I actually do. Golgotha means skull in Aramaic, and the Latin version of skull is Calvary, so Mount Calvary. Mount Calvary, where Jesus was crucified, is Golgotha. Think of it, you're getting your kids all dressed up. It's, you know, a nice spring day. Maybe go eat some ice cream, have fun together. And to go mini golfing, you could go to the Golgotha Fun Park. But why did they name it after the hill on which Jesus was crucified? Better than calling it Magic Mountain, which they're probably against. Mm. So, well, anyway, sad to see the Holy Land experience go without me ever having the chance to go there. But there's still the Ark somewhere in Kentucky, so maybe we can get to that. Speaking of mini golf, though, the time that Father Art puked in a bucket, if I'm not mistaken, that might have been on the day that we went to another now defunct mini golf park called Mulligan McGluffer's Adventure Putt-Putt or something in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. I think that was the day that our father most famously vomited into the yellow candy container. Yeah, the Tupperware container. Which you might have heard mentioned in our 50th anniversary episode way back when. Well, it was definitely Gettysburg. Yeah. We were doing the uh, Gettysburg tour on cassette tape, and we were listening to that in the big tan van and driving around. It was definitely there, so it could have been. Well, Brother Brad, one man who will never again puke in a yellow candy bucket is our Father Art, and we're going to ask him some questions. Should we go back to using lobster as food for prisoners? No! How far do you think a whale could spit a human under calm weather conditions? 100 yards. 100? If you found yourself suddenly trapped in the mouth of a large sea creature, which you hadn't even seen, would a lack of teeth make you feel optimistic? No. What would make you feel optimistic? Just getting out of there. Once you determined that you were inside a whale's mouth, what would your next move be? I would scream for no purpose at all. (laughs) Me too. Well, folks, now that we've heard from Father Art, it means that our time together is coming to an end for this episode. We've said just about everything we're prepared to say about nature's ninjas, Noah and the whale, Geppetto and the whale, unlucky sailors, bait balls, and miniature golfing on Calvary. But fear not, just as soon as we can dig back into the archives and find another gem of a text exchange, there will be another episode coming your way. In the meantime, you can head over to our Instagram at Things I Text My Brother Podcast to drop us a note about what you liked, what you didn't like, or to tell us about something that we got totally wrong. You might even have time to go tell a friend, an enemy, and a total stranger to give us a listen as well. If you manage to do any of that, the fraternity of Driards will be forever grateful. But most importantly, thanks for listening, and we'll talk to you next time. All right, Brad, I don't have anything.
else. And we have. I don't either, one. but I'm kicking myself because we talked about people being stuck out in the sun and I missed my. And there'll be sun, sun, sun all over the bodies. There'll be sun, sun, sun all down our necks. There'll be sun, sun, sun all over our faces. And sun, sun, sun. So what the heck? I had my chance for knowing the whale. How many days time will that occur in? And five years time. Oh, five years time. Yes. Yes. No, I actually wanted to know the days, Brad. So five years times times 365. 1,835. But at least one of those years has to be a leap year, possibly two. So there would be two acceptable answers of how many days that could happen. That is, that's three. There'd be three acceptable. Oh, yeah. No. Why? If there's potentially two leap years, it could be one leap year or two years. There has to be one leap year in that time. So oh, five yes. times. Yeah, yeah. No, you're right. Yep, two. Yep. My math is crap. You're right. 